focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters, Han Dan and Kwon Soa. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you. All right. Uh, we are going to start things off uh, with the big news that uh, we've been watching. Uh, there were just reports that uh, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was going to make this historic visit to Taiwan. We also knew that it was going to be a very controversial visit to the island state as well. Uh, not just here in Korea, but the world has been watching very closely. The trip has been made. It's been confirmed. Of course, she's there making uh, different meetings left and right. Uh, but of course, this has triggered an immediate response from China, which labored her trip as extremely dangerous. All right, Tan, let's get the latest on her uh, visit to Taiwan. To honor America's unwavering commitment to supporting Taiwan's vibrant democracy was the key point of a statement issued by Pelosi minutes after she landed at Songshan Airport in downtown Taipei last night. Through the statement, Pelosi, number three in the U.S. line of presidential succession, said, America's solidarity with the 23 million people of Taiwan is more important today than ever as the world faces a choice between autocracy and democracy. Pelosi also penned an opinion piece published uh, by the Washington Post upon her arrival in which she said Taiwan is under threat by the government in Beijing economically, in cyberspace, and potentially by military force. And that, quote unquote, we cannot stand by as the Chinese Communist Party proceeds to threaten Taiwan and democracy itself. She added, in the face of China's accelerating aggression, the U.S. congressional delegation's visit should be seen as an unequivocal statement that America stands with Taiwan as it defends itself and its freedom. Pelosi also cited China's brutal crackdown on political dissent in Hong Kong and its treatment of Muslim Uyghurs and other minorities, which the U.S has deemed genocide. This marks the first visit from a similarly high-ranking U.S. official in 25 years. Yeah, I think, uh, Tan, you made, uh, I'm glad you, that you mentioned that she's number three in U.S. line of presidential succession because I don't know if anyone knows, but if, let's say, the president is unable to uh, be the president, let's say Joe Biden can't be the president, right? The next in line would be Kamala Harris, and let's mm -hmm. say Kamala Harris is not uh can't be the president for some whatever reason, then yes, Nancy Pelosi would then be uh, next in line to be president. So this is a very high-ranking U.S. official that's visiting Taiwan at this time. Uh, Pelosi, having met with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen and also the chairman of the world's biggest contract chip maker, uh, we've predicted this to happen. I mean, Joe Biden, when he came to Korea, he met, he went to Samsung chip, chip plant. Uh, we also saw uh, the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen making a trip over to LG Energy Solution. And of course, Pelosi was going to make uh, take a, uh, hold a meeting with TSMC there. Uh, what do we know was the, the I guess, the, the heart of the, the discussions there? Right. Uh, the Taiwanese leader reaffirmed the country's will to protect sovereignty and democracy. She said, facing deliberately heightened military threats, Taiwan will not back down and will firmly hold the nation's sovereignty and continue to hold the line of defense for democracy. She stressed that Taiwan hopes to cooperate and work in unity with democracies around the world to jointly safeguard democratic values. Citing Russia's invasion of Ukraine, she also said aggression against democratic Taiwan would have a tremendous impact on the security of the entire Indo-Pacific. She also vowed to deepen economic cooperation and supply chain resistance resilience with the U.S. Pelosi, in response, said she was proud of America's enduring friendship with Taiwan, adding that America's determination to preserve democracy here in Taiwan and around the world remains ironclad. She went on to say that the story of Taiwan is an inspiration to freedom-loving people in the U.S. and around the world. Pelosi also met with Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, or TSMC, Chairman Mark Liu. The meeting was an essential part of Pelosi's trip as the U.S. moves to boost cooperation with the world's biggest contract chip maker to isolate China uh, from advanced chip making. According to Ker Qianming, senior lawmaker of Taiwan Democratic Progressive Party, the two spoke matters related to the U.S. Chips Act 
passed last week. Prior to the meeting, Pelosi stressed that the U.S. semiconductor bill will provide good opportunities for U.S.-Taiwan chip cooperation. The $280 billion Chips and Science Act includes $52 billion in incentives for domestic semiconductor production and research, as well as an investment tax credit for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, TSMC is one of the world's most advanced semiconductor foundries, taking over 50 percent of the global chip in the fourth quarter of 2021, according to various market research firms. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, it's no surprise that uh, when we talked about the chip Four alliance, right, that the U.S. is really pushing for that the, the three other countries aside from the United States that's involved in the alliance. Well, I mean, this isn't set on stone just yet is South Korea. And then you have Taiwan and you have Japan, which has. A lot of the key materials in processing, a lot of these uh, uh, semiconductor chips. So, I mean, we've been saying this for some quite time now. We we know what the motive for the United States is, uh, the alliance that they're trying to form here. And uh, it's not surprising that, uh, you know, you have one of the highest ranking U.S. officials heading over to Taiwan. Uh, but this is despite the fact that China has been really uh, sending threats left and right, right verbally, thankfully, uh, although we have seen some, uh, I believe, uh, aircrafts move in and out around the region uh, prior to this visit here. Uh, they have, though, threatened uh, with some military action, also summoned the U.S. ambassador to Beijing over Pelosi's trip. So, uh, so well, let's let's get, a, uh, I guess, a summary of what uh, Beijing's response has been amid this uh, trip here. Right. Uh, targeted military operations is how China put it immediately after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi touched down in Taiwan. Series of joint military actions around the island were set to have started Tuesday night, is what China's military said, and would continue throughout the week, meaning joint air and sea drills testing conventional missiles in the sea east of Taiwan, as well as live fire drills from Thursday to Sunday were announced. China's foreign ministry on Tuesday night said in a statement that it strongly opposes Pelosi's to quote-unquote China's Taiwan region and that it is a serious a violation of the One China Principle and agreements under the Three China U.S. communiques. The statement also called the speaker's visit and activities a major political provocation meant to upgrade the U.S.'s exchanges with Taiwan. Now, it was quite a long text, uh, I have to say, with China stressing that the Taiwan issue is the most important and most sensitive one at the very heart of China-U.S. ties and uh, also as part of of its furious response, China uh, summoned U.S. Ambassador to China Nicholas Burns overnight, with China's Vice Foreign Minister Xie Feng voicing strong protests over Pelosi's egregious trip, is what the um, Vice Foreign Minister said, according to state media there. Uh, Xinhua News Agency quoted him as saying, uh, the consequences are extremely serious and that China will not sit idly by. Taiwan's Defense Ministry, meanwhile, on Wednesday condemned China's announcement of military exercises, saying the move reflected its mentality of, quote, using force to resolve differences and uh, said the move won't help China's international image and hurt people on both sides of the strait. Taiwan's military detected at least 21 Chinese military aircraft flying into the island's air defense identification zone. Let me tell you how serious it is right now uh, in Taiwan. I'm just reading up on some of the uh, the reports coming out in different outlets, including Reuters. Uh, Taiwan has been preparing its air raid shelters. Air raid shelters. You know when you prepare for that mm. is if there is a potential war right. mm. or some kind of invasion is what's happening. And so... Uh, they're sending a lot of these fi- flyers to people and making preparations, letting them know where these uh, designated shelters are, where people can take cover of Chinese missiles, let's say, start flying in. Uh, there's, uh, you know, bunkers there letting people know where the bunkers are, where these subway systems or subway stations where they can go, or like these underground shopping centers where they can go. And apparently uh, the capital Taipei has more than 4,600 shelters uh, that can accommodate mm-hmm. some 12 million people. So. Uh, they're taking this seriously right now. I, I think this threat by China, it's not one of those things where like you're trying to just scare off the United States or mm-hmm. you know Taiwan. I think the threat is uh, real. Um, but uh, Pelosi's visit to Taiwan still gaining bipartisan support. Uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, my goodness, I haven't heard his name in a <laughs> really long time, uh, backed her plan, tweeting, 
Nancy, I'll go with you. Uh, but not everyone is on board, calling her visit reckless and unnecessary as well. Uh, t- t- tell us why they're against her visit. Right. In an op-ed published by the New York Times, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Thomas Friedman, has laid out three very clear reasons why her visit, according to his words, is reckless, dangerous, and irresponsible. First is the risk of the U.S. facing a two-way conflict with China and Russia, both nuclear states. He says the U.S. is being plunged into indirect conflicts with a nuclear-armed Russia and a nuclear-armed China at the same time, asserting that it is geopolitics 101 that you don't court a two-front war with the other two superpowers at the same time. Secondly, because it may provoke China to provide military assistance to Russia in its fight against Ukraine. Friedman explains that President Biden held a series of very tough meetings with China's leadership to convince Beijing not to enter the Ukraine conflict by providing military assistance to Russia. Biden warned that if China entered the war in Ukraine on Russia's side, Beijing would be risking access to its two most important export markets, the United States and the European Union. And so So far, China has responded by not providing military aid to Putin. But with Pelosi's visit, he says this could change. He also points out what many had overlooked, that Pelosi will actually give Chinese President Xi Jinping an opportunity to divert attention from his own failures. Uh, such as excessively strict COVID-19 lockdowns of China's major cities and a huge real estate bubble that is now deflating. He says Pelosi's visit could not come at a worse timing because President Xi is on the eve of locking in an indefinite extension of his role as China's leader at the upcoming 20th Communist Party Congress. Other top experts like professors at Yale and former U.S. ambassador to China, Max Baucus, also echoed Friedman, calling her visit an unnecessary mistake. You know, the uh, the third point that you made uh, was made by Friedman was is it quite an interesting one? Because um, usually what they say is in history, when there is a world leader that's uh, going down in popularity, right, it's losing support from its people. uh, What they usually do is they go to war. Uh, and when there is a war, what it does is it you get you know the, the pride of the country, right? You get support from its right. people, and so uh, a very effective way to cover your yeah, failures yeah. and uh, miss policies. So, a um, good example of this is, for example, like George W. Bush, right? Like he wasn't the most popular right. uh, president in the United States. Now. Uh, I'm not saying that you know he caused you know the 9/11 incident. I think that happened you know it, because of Al Qaeda and stuff like that. But like for example, going into Iraq, mm-hmm. right, uh, wasn't something that was very controversial. They they found no weapons of mass destruction there, uh, but calling war against uh, Iraq and then and then you know obviously we saw Bush's uh, popularity you know skyrocket uh, once there was a war. So right. that you're basically giving you know I guess Xi Jinping all the more reasons mm-hmm. uh, to start some kind of conflict and. Uh, gain, I guess, uh, support from its people here. Uh, but Pelosi's trip even appears to be already impacting businesses between U.S. and China. A Chinese battery maker halting plans for a plant over in North America. I, I'm not surprised about this. So tell us more about this. Right. Uh, CATL, the largest battery cell supplier yeah, in the yeah. world, or uh, batteries that makes batteries for electric vehicles. Very important too right now. Mm-hmm. So CATL decided to delay its announcement of a multi-billion dollar North American plant that would supply to automakers like Tesla and Ford. The Chinese battery giant was reportedly considering at least two locations in Mexico near the Texas border and other sites in the U.S. for this battery cell plant. Uh, The project is likely to be an investment of as much as 5 billion U.S. dollars. But right after Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, the company seems to have responded on the back of China's protests. As reports say, CATL has put its plan plan on hold. Now, it's not really a scrapping as of yet, but sources say it 
uh, plans to wait a few months, maybe until September or October before making its announcement. Uh, according to Bloomberg, there were no responses from CATL, neither Tesla or Ford. Uh, watchers say the pausing of the announcement is unlikely going to worsen. Uh, so this could be a symbolic step with the Chinese government behind mm. uh, because CATL has been working, for instance, very close with Ford, with vehicles being supplied to China as well. So the Chinese giant will need the U.S. automakers, too, for its own um, benefits as well. Yeah, you know, you know what's interesting is I'm sure the U.S. saw this coming, right? Uh, if they do decide they're going to pull out, uh, it, it's not a surprise. But uh, you, you think about Janet Yellen's recent trip, you know, where, where she visited. She visited uh, uh, LG Energy Solution, mm-hmm. which is like a major battery plant, right? right. And also recently that, what was it? Uh, I believe Joe Biden had uh, talks with uh, Chet yeah. mm-hmm. uh chairman of SK, because they want to talk to SK Hynix, uh, who's going to be, you know, very big on the semiconductor and stuff like that. But uh, battery is the other big thing with the LG Energy Solution, and so which is why Janet Yellen made that visit. So I, I think they're preparing for this. They knew this was going to come. Uh, CATL, definitely a, a major a powerhouse in that frontier. Uh, also, in response to Pelosi's uh, Taiwan visit, South Korea's top office has reiterated the need for dialogue with regional players for peace and stability. Uh, it's going to be hard to come by with uh, this recent trip. But, uh, Tan, tell us more about this. Right. A key presidential official said that the government's stance is that Seoul will maintain close communication with the nations concerned on all issues under the banner of the need for peace and stability in the region through dialogue and cooperation. The presidential office said that it welcomes Pelosi's visit to South Korea and hopes to make achievements during her talks with National Assembly Speaker Kim Jin-pyo. Pelosi is set to arrive in South Korea as part of her Asian tour late this evening. Kim and Pelosi are scheduled to hold talks tomorrow, and the two speakers will hold a joint press conference before having lunch together. The presidential official also added that President Yoon song yeol has no plan to meet with Pelosi as he is currently on summer vacation. Guys, um, I'm sure, again, we've been talking about uh, Pelosi's visit. I, I, I think <laughs> Pelosi's visit to South Korea is big, too. But it's uh, let's face it, it's overshadowed uh, by her visit to Taiwan right now. Uh, In fact, for our listeners out there, we're actually going to be trying to connect with uh, someone over in Taiwan tomorrow to get some more information uh, on the meeting itself. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And I just want to let all of our listeners know that we are giving you the most unbiased take on this, Um, as it could be a very sensitive issue here. We're just going to base this on facts here. But so let's start off with you. Uh, Let's get your thoughts on Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. I don't know how unbiased this is going to be, <laughs> but uh, I have to say that many people and experts do say that the visit does not really bring many benefits to the U.S. And the point I in particular want to make is the timing. Okay. Uh, the last time a person as high ranking as Pelosi made a similar trip was Newt Gingrich in 1997. As Tan mentioned, that was 25 years ago, a whopping 25 years ago. But... Back then, U.S.-China relations weren't how they are nowadays. No. And China was also more tolerant about the visit back then, although there there were um, some arrangements made before, prior to the visit. For instance, uh, I think Gingrich was not, not allowed to, you know, depart from mainland China. And anyways, uh, these days, some officials actually um, in China that are comparing the visit back then and uh, um, the visit this week, uh, they do actually say that... The the visit back then and China's response was a mistake. They should have been more furious about it. Uh, so really, I think this uh, visit's purpose is uh, more about showing Pelosi's commitment to Taiwan. But the risks are just too big. And how big? I want to make a very cautious statement here. That's, however, not unrealistic. A third world war. And uh, I'm saying this because if China-U.S. ties go further downhill... And Beijing starts to back Moscow in Ukraine, and China will use more force in Taiwan, and Russia then backs China. We've got two powerful countries that might partner up even with more countries, and that could really lead to the world being split in two, and then even 
develop into a worse situation. Yeah, and and I've mentioned this before on the show. Uh, the many things I say repetitively, over and over again. Uh, one of the things I say is teams forming. Right? I, I talk about how I'm scared about teams forming. Grouping. And mm-hmm. Yeah, they're basically grouping, and it's been r- Russia and China, and uh, that's the last thing you want to see. And uh, then I, I said this even before the uh, the Ukraine invasion. Uh, but uh, before I get into my uh, two cents on this, uh, Tan, what about yourself? I want to get your thoughts on Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. You know, there's no doubt about the need to defend and protect democratic values, but for three reasons, I'm a bit concerned about her visit. Mm. First off, this puts South Korea in an even tougher situation sandwiched between the U.S. and China. You know, we had a little room to breathe, a bit of leeway to seek strategic ambiguity, but Pelosi's visit and her remarks that the world faces a choice between autocracy and democracy is pushing countries like South Korea closer to the edge. Some experts are even calling this the worst conflict between the U.S. and China since the Korean War. It's a situation that is clearly not in the best interest of our country. Secondly, concerns are rising over the immense economic impact the visit could bring on financial markets and the already troubled global supply bottleneck. It has already sent stocks tumbling, and analysts say it may have a lasting ripple effect on global markets. So the visit came at a very risky timing, I think, adding to the list, the long list of investor worries ranging from a restrictive Federal Reserve policy, U.S. Federal Reserve policy, that is, to the specter of an economic recession. And Lastly, President Biden was very cautious and concerned about Pelosi's visit until the very last minute, trying hard to convince the world that the visit says nothing about U.S. policy toward China or Taiwan. President Biden had long asserted that although the U.S. would come to the defense of Taiwan if China were to invade the island, he made clear that the U.S. did not change its stance on one China policy. And Biden had specifically raised the topic of Pelosi's visit during his phone talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping last week, where he emphasized that Congress is an independent branch of government and that Speaker Pelosi makes her own decisions, as other members of Congress do, about their overseas travel. And so judging from this, questions are being raised about the necessity of her trip, I think, at a time when the war in Ukraine is not over. Yeah. Uh, John Jang, who I believe he's he's one of our listeners, He's I think he's over in the U.S., uh, he says, uh, it's like throwing stones in a hornet's nest. Um, <sighs> goodness. It's a very concerning trip, uh, and so uh, and you you mentioned it cautiously, but I don't think that's out of the question. Uh, it's not just you, but I think many many experts who've been watching this very carefully are fearing that this could be another step towards potential third world war. Um, I think the good thing that we saw, and I mean, nothing was good out of the Ukraine invasion, uh, but the one positive thing was the fact that China was very ambiguous in his support for Russia. I mean, like, they, they, you know, what is it? Uh, Xi Jinping t- talked to uh, Putin and said, we support you. But there was, like, no military support, right? right? I think China also knew that this was, that would have been suicide. It would have mm-hmm. been terrible for them to mm-hmm. get involved militarily. Then it would have been through a world war. Right. And I think the only reason why uh, that was the case is because the U.S., although they have been supporting Ukraine, it was like they've been giving them like military equipment, right? But they, they haven't been sending troops in there, which yeah. then would have been terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would have sparked the Third World War already. But if let's say uh, China decides, uh, and, and going back to Anton, I'm glad you brought that uh, mm-hmm. thing with uh, Friedman here uh, with what he said. Number mm-hmm. two. I think was what it was, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, giving basically a China reason to support Russia. Oh, uh, right. When Biden had long, very tough meetings with Chinese leadership yeah. to convince Beijing not to provide military assistance, but Pelosi's visit yeah, may yeah, yeah. change that. Yeah, I think I think you're. I think he's right. I think you're right, and uh, I think that could potentially spark uh, China to get involved with the Ukraine war, which is going to lead to a massive outbreak and. If China does indeed decide, and I think the whole news with the, the air raid drills and things like that, I think that's not uh, a just-in-case kind of a thing. I think they're making preparations. I think they know that it could potentially happen. There's a high chance of that happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, third World War, I think it's really possible. Um, that's, And you know what the craziest thing is? I remember, I forget who I was talking to, was 
back before wars were fought over like the territory, mm. and then wars were fought over oil, and then now they're saying that wars are gonna be it's over semiconductors. Like this is like the new gold. Um, and so Taiwan, like China, we know why the U.S. is, you know, going to Taiwan. You know, they want to get that chip for alliance and so forth. But that, that could potentially cause a huge ripple effect. And I'm fearing for the worst right now. I think the smarter thing, if they wanted to make any kind of talks with semiconductor with TSMC or talk to President Tsai Ing-wen, I think could have been done virtually. Uh, but I do want to mention that although many experts are quite uh, concerned about Pelosi's visit, most uh, quite a lot of them are very negative, uh, pessimistic about her visit, although even so, most experts are saying the possibility of China initiating a military attack of any sort is extremely low. You know what the crazy thing about that is? I wish to believe that. But that's what they were saying about Russia invading Ukraine, too, mm. initially. Like, there were always, like, there were signs that the Russians might invade Ukraine. But they're like, we, we live in the 21st century where things can be kind of uh, worked out through dialogue. And I, I, there were a lot of people, I remember mm. doing uh, interviews, uh, you know, before this. I'm like, what are the chances of a Russian invasion? Oh, highly unlikely was yeah. what everyone was saying. Once it happened, it was really surreal if you go back a few months Yeah, ago. yeah. And then when it did happen, it was like, oh, my goodness. I, I think we're living now in an era where these wars could happen. But, you know, who's going to lose out on it? This Ukraine crisis, you know, it's not NATO. Well, I mean, NATO kind of NATO countries are suffering from like energy crisis, but United States aren't losing out on anything. It's the war is not being fought in the United States. If there is a war, there's going to be a war in Taiwan. There's, it's going to be them losing out on everything. There's not going to be a war battlefield going on uh, in, in in the United States or in China. It's not going to happen. So what a lot of uh, experts are saying is that it's countries like Ukraine and countries like Taiwan. They're going to lose out on this because that's where the battlefield is going to be. The battlefield is not going to be in South Korea. The battlefield is not going to be in Russia. The battlefield is not going to be in China. Uh, it's those smaller uh, you know, areas, uh, island and uh, countries that are going to lose out the most out of this. I This is, I mean, I, th I think if they were really wanted to do a meeting, they could have just done this virtually, to be honest with you. Um, again, we'll, we'll take a closer look on how things pan out because I think this is not... And I think there's going to be bigger things to happen after this. Uh, also, we have the annual ASEAN Regional Forum to talk about, uh, which is going to take place over in Cambodia. Certainly a lot of things happening in this region here. South Korea's Foreign Minister Park Jin also embarking on a trip to the capital of Phnom Penh uh, to attend the ARF as well as other ASEAN meetings. Well, let's get the details of this. Right. So South Korea's top diplomat was set to depart this evening from Incheon International Airport uh, to attend ASEAN Regional Forum or ARF and also other meetings and ASEAN, of course, standing for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, so uh, one of his first um, meetings is going to be uh, tomorrow on uh, Thursday, where he's going to have the South Korea ASEAN ministerial meeting and uh, also where he is going to brief the ASEAN members on South, the new UN administration's policies in regards to cooperation with ASEAN, and also the ASEAN Plus 3 meeting, which involves the 10 ASEAN member states and South Korea, China, and Japan is going to take place. And uh, also, Park is expected to meet individually with the ASEAN uh, members uh, in bilateral summits. On the 5th, so on Friday, he's going to attend the EAS or East Asia Summit, which includes 16 members, which is the ASEAN, plus Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand, and Korea. Uh, but uh, before, um, there were also the US and uh, Russia that had earlier participated in the EAS as well. Now, the most important one, the meeting is ARF, which is also going to be on Friday. And uh, here um, we're going to have important leaders attending this meeting. The U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and China's Foreign Minister uh, Wang Yi. Uh, Japan's foreign minister, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. So they're going to have a lot of topics to discuss. It's going to be South China Sea, Myanmar, Russia, Ukraine, North Korea. So high tensions are expected to fill the meeting rooms, especially with the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit just recently. The U.S. and China are expected to clash. So North Korea is likely to be more of a sideline topic this time around because yes. there were times when North Korea 
Korea was the main mm-hmm. issue at the ARF. And even uh, nor- although ARF is the only regional security meeting that North Korea actually attends, this time they won't have their foreign minister, but a lower ranking officials are going to attend the meeting. So uh, how much of a message to North Korea is going to be in the joint statement uh, in the ARF joint statement is the question for South Korea. Uh, and in many cases, the statement itself does not come out on the day of the meeting, but uh, usually on the next day, uh, sometimes it takes even longer. And it doesn't really look good for South Korea in terms of garnering support on North Korea because the uh, the country that's hosting this is Cambodia. And Cambodia has strong ties with China and is also one of the rare countries that has close ties with North Korea, with right. North Korea also having an embassy in Cambodia. Well, it's going to be a busy uh, couple of days uh, in this region here. Again, uh, I'm sure there's going to be more developments on this front. And we'll, of course, uh, cover all that and more here in our program. Uh, Back here in the nation, uh, let's talk COVID-19. Because, uh, again, we were feeling, fearing for the worst. Uh, It is Wednesday. Wednesday is usually when we see... Uh, the peak of the weekly infection mm-hmm. cases here, daily new infections here in the country reaching nearly 120,000 this time. Uh, this is the highest level in more than 100 days. Uh, Tom, let's get the latest uh, numbers here. Sure. According to the Central Disease Control Headquarters, Korea added more than 119,900 new COVID cases today, driving up the cumulative caseload to over 20 million. Although the doubling trend appears to have slowed in recent days, today's figures surged to the highest level since mid-April. The the seven-day average now stands at over 86,500. The number of imported cases continue to soar, spiking to 600, shattering previous records yet again. Korea has been posting a three-digit number of overseas transmissions since June, with easing of border restrictions and the beginning of the summer holidays. What's quite alarming is that Korea confirmed five more cases of the BA275, also known as the Centaurus, today, bringing the total to 14 cases. All the new cases were from overseas, one from Nepal and four from India. Of the total 14 cases, 11 were imported from overseas, while three were locally transmitted. BA275 is a new, fast-spreading Omicron subvariant that are known to have a stronger ability to evade immunity with higher transmissibility than the original Omicron strain. Meanwhile, the number of severe cases are continuing the doubling trend, with the number, of, uh, with the number increasing to over 280, which is nearly three times higher than two weeks ago. 26 people died of COVID overnight. Now, of course, uh, amid the uh, the resurging uh, number of COVID-19, there was a big question of whether or not they were going to implement, uh, uh, I guess, these uh, social distancing measures once again. Uh, but the government did say uh, no strict measures will be put in back in place. Uh, they're going to base everything on science. Uh, they did address the current uh, situation there in a uh, COVID-19 response meeting, uh, vowed on targeted measures against uh, the recent spread. So let's get the details of that. Sure. While health authorities are predicting the current wave will peak in around two weeks, the government announced this Wednesday that it will carry out targeted COVID-19 response measures. That meaning it will target specific facilities or places that are vulnerable to the virus rather than imposing strict social distancing measures that will make the people's uh, daily lives difficult again. Vice Health Minister Igi said at a meeting today that in the early period of the pandemic, the country had to impose strict social distancing measures that limited private gatherings and operation hours of businesses. Uh, But now that there's accumulated data from the past two and a half years, the latest wave will be dealt with targeted antivirus measures that focus on facilities that report high number of cases. Uh, He also stressed that Korea has enough vaccines, treatment, as well as medical capacity. And uh, I think they're also going to expand the number of hospital beds, uh, even so that we have enough beds with daily cases hovering at around 300,000. Uh, there's also some, there are also some positive numbers that he mentioned. The reproduction rate of the virus has dropped from 1.54 in the third week of July to 1.29 last week, but it's still too early to let our guards down, and it's still above one, which is uh, still meaning that the virus is spreading. And uh, he asked for extra caution at places like concert halls, beaches, nursing hospitals, and uh, yes, uh, so I think they're going to have some more detailed 
details on what these targeted um, response measures will be in the yeah, future. Yeah, and I think that's a smart thing to do. I, I, don't, I think it's going to be so hard to go back to how things were with all these restrictions in place, you know, four people and then 9 p.m. curfews and things like that. Um, and uh, basically, you know, putting these measures and stricter measures in place for hospitals, nursing hospitals, things like that, where you have people who can likely die from the virus. And again, looking at the numbers here, I mean, 20, 20 plus people dying overnight because of COVID-19. I, you know, despite what some of the experts are saying, you know, the, you know, lesser symptoms from the Omicron, I don't think it's true. From all the people that I've talked to recently that had covid uh, it's been as bad. And so I think uh, we can't really let our guards down, especially uh, right now. We are at the height of the uh, the summer vacation season right now, right? Uh, nevertheless, guys, thank you very much uh, for your report today and your insights on some of these issues. Please stay safe and uh, we'll see you guys again. Thank see you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.